In this episode of What the Prophets Say with me, Emma Stark, I'm joined by the joy that is my husband, David Stark, and the reeds, Nigel and Louise. And this considerable shared weight of wisdom is taking you on an adventure in your ears today (laughs) around how the church needs to reform and take a new shape, reorder its priorities in the days of crisis. Join us for this episode of What the Prophets Say. Hello, loyal listeners, and a very warm welcome to another episode of What the Prophets Say with me, Emma Stark. And as promised from our last episode, loyal listeners, you will know that I am joined by the glory, the triumphing intellects that are my my husband, (laughs) my husband, David Stark, and Louise and Nigel Reed. You should have loved that introduction, guys. We do. More, more, Lord. Fine minds. Fine minds. Oh, boy. <laughs> well, let's take it, David. Take, take it. it. I'm We've now got to back it up. <laughs> yes, that's true. <laughs> For the next however uh, long. Triumphing intellects. I'm going to use that one again. Triumphing okay. Intellects. So, David, Louise, Nigel, how are you all doing today? Oh, excellent. Yeah. Really good. Very good. In form. Mm-hmm. In on form. In on form and in form. And oh. my intellect is moving. <laughs> yeah. I do feel like my brain is being pushed like uh, nothing else i'm working on a book emma's book i'm oh, working another on another book that we're working on my my daughter is doing her final year dissertation at university another son is wrestling with uh, an essay on abortion for his um uh, wow. re studies yeah. and another one is writing an essay on well, two essays one on some very grim poems and uh Gosh. I'm on PE. So everyone has an assignment wow. that I'm helping with. On my and because dyslexia oh. rules, I was going to say OK, but dys- dyslexia rules KO rather than OK <laughs> in our house. <laughs> and uh, David is the only um, non-dyslexic That's champion. Really. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Wow. So okay. he is chief editor. Well done, David. He's appointed to the role. If only it was- <laughs> Just yeah. fixing the spelling. <laughs> just oh, just oh, fixing the spelling everywhere. Oh, the grammar. It's great, we... but my brain feels pulled in every wow. direction. Yeah. Bless it. Yeah. Uh-huh. Many Amen. subjects. Yeah, yeah. actually quite difficult. So Jessica's dissertation is fascinating. Um, she's doing obviously a journalism degree over in Edinburgh, but she's looking at the rise of um, anti-faith bias in the media. But of course, she's got a scientifically... Yes. She can't just speculate has it, to has to be, it. Mm-hmm. has to cite it. It's actually fairly easy to measure, um, but that is quite a weighty thing to, uh, yeah. And huge. Huge, mm-hmm. yeah. 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 Yeah, along with Samuel's um, abortion essays and um, uh, Peter's filmmaking. Well, I think we're we're more or less past that phase now with our Thankfully. kids, although our eldest daughter has just gone back to do a second master's. But I don't think we can help her. Certainly with, with some of the it's stuff well, some of the stuff she's on at the moment is all about statistics and so she can forget us on that. We can't help at all. Yeah. But we have have definitely given liberal, liberally into uh, various dissertations in the past, yes. whether it was the anti jazz movement of the nineteen thirties. In, in Ireland, Ireland. Yeah. Oh, one dissertation on that. Jazz, yeah. As in jazz music, yes. as a big thing. I hate jazz music. Oh, well, you would have gone down well in well, Ireland so in the nineteen thirties. So the hierarchy 1930s. in Ireland. So oh, really? oh, so oh, particularly. Yes. Am, just, am I a one with Catholicism yes, in an anti-jazz? Surely that's statement. just. Out and out racism was it? Was it? Look, it's nineteen thirties Ireland. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Anything it went. It's actually a fascinating story. <laughs> really fascinating story. I just find jazz music puts me in a bad mood. Depends uh-huh. on what sort of jazz. But Why in the nineteen thirties, jazz music well, was it's very, very chaotic. different. There, some of it's very chaotic. So I can understand well, that's when that. you get into free jazz in the yeah, 1960s, yeah. 1970s. Oh, Great, oh, we're going to have oh, a pre podcast oh, music oh, that puts yeah. me out of Oh, oh now yeah. I'm on my specialist <laughs> subject. That, yes, now I can flex so, my so, intellect. So, well, truly. Well, flex your <laughs> intellect on jazz music because you were a pro mm. trumpet player for years. The great thing um, about jazz is, as Miles Davis once said, that it, you can't ever play the wrong note oh, because it's about good. the note that you follow it up with. So if you make a mistake, just play the next note um, in the ne- and it, you just pretend you know where you're going, Miles which Davis. is a little li- bit like looking at all these essays. You just have to <laughs> you just have to keep going and make it sound like you know where you're going. 
Half. Okay, trumpet genius. I know Miles Davis is your trumpeting, one of your trumpeting heroes. He is. Winter Marsalis is up there. Mm, yes, yes. So, Miles Davis, he he was the master of um, doing uh, a lot with not very much. He rarely plays on his records. However, I the, sympathize with he, that. <laughs> <laughs> he advanced the genre in remarkable ways. Very creative, intensely creative. So actually, technically, he wasn't a great player, really. <gasps> Especially, he did a lot of drugs. He was really out of it for a long period of time. This, and this he is stick actually a Christian mute. broadcast after yeah, I've done the Winter <laughs> Marsalis, Miles was. Davis and Jazz. But it was in, in pushing the genre forward in his creativity. because We don't see it now because we have the fruits of it in our other forms of music, pop How music and so on, because of the ways they, they pushed these pioneers of jazz, push things forward. But, so now I'm going to have, before we jump into actually helping people with um, Christian leadership, favourite genre of music? My favourite genre yeah, of Yeah, or favourite composer. And Louise oh. and I are going to ask you this too. Favourites? Oh, Russian music of the uh, 20th century. Russian classical Flip music it, of the 20th century. I knew century. it. Shostakovich. Oh, I cannot stand it. Shostakovich, Prokofiev. Yeah, come on. It, it, it suits the Scottish climate. <clears throat> Dark, moody, brooding. I really don't. Uh, do you know he puts his headphones on when he's editing my books, oh, and, and just he thinks to I can't hear it. But it's so loud that Shostakovich symphonies are literally bleeding out of his ears, and then I can't think straight. You've just reminded me. This is one for Nigel. Oh, um, oh my. <laughs> I, 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 I where I, I've forgotten where I saw it advertised, but um, it's it's a book summarizing the writings of the Russian Christian philosophers of the twentieth century. You know that who who went through the Stalinist oppression, yeah. and it looked really uh, good. And I saw it yesterday, and I have completely forgotten what it was called or who wrote it. But just talking about that has reminded me. Mm. Find out, David. Yes, because they they're fascinating. Oh, I think. And it's... the whole Russian thing is huge. We could come to that. But we there's could a, come I listened to, that. to a, I listened to a podcast yesterday by the guy. Kristen, whatever his name is, he's the Russian guy, and he was talking about the his grandparents were born born in the Gulag, oh and God. he's commentating on stuff now, yeah. and it's amazing. Sorry, Russian Russian music, keep going. Yeah. Russian music is your favorite. Ru Russian music, okay. Russian but, around. Well, of a certain or, genre. Or worship music, you know. Or worship you music. You have to put that in, yeah. okay. please. I know. I do remember. Uh, please, please, please tell me it's Abba and Dancing do Queen. You know just to balance. <laughs> Well, well, you know, while you were just talking, I was thinking, oh, my goodness, I am just going to so bring this conversation down to a whole different level. <laughs> I am not a great lover of classical music, although I keep thinking mm -hmm. it's because when you start off quite mm -hmm. young um, learning music and mm -hmm. you are thrown only into classical music, I kind of think it does something to you and sort of vaccinates you against it. Um, I will come back in my in my That's latter years. I will. Oh, yes. okay, fair enough, fair enough. It's from the expert here, mm. but I will say just for, for for the listeners and the viewers mm -hmm. um, who like something a little different. Um, I had a wonderful experience just before Christmas a few months ago, where as a family we went to a carpenter's. Um, uh, I was going to say conference. It, was it wasn't great. a conference. Concert. It was a concert. Thank you. So For those who don't know, can you sing us one of their ditties so that we can like... Mr. Postman. Oh, Why no. do birds suddenly up? Please don't sing, Michael. Please don't sing. Every time Yeah, we'll be getting copyright strikes if you sing it too well. like me, they long to be close to you. So we had the whole place, the whole 3,000 people in the... Um, uh, concert hall just going for it but I have to tell you it's a, it's a girl who does a car carpenter tribute act it was absolutely brilliant and the feel good factor none of your Russian whatever but the feel good factor <laughs> singing away with 3,000 people I tell you it was it was better than the average church service for, oh for oneness what? and oh, every, everybody <laughs> singing well, everybody no. was Hang singing on. why is why do you say that? Because people were there. They were, first of all, they were loving it. Uh -huh. Secondly, mm. they knew the music. Mm. Thirdly, they knew the words. Oh. Fourthly, the songs actually meant something to them. Oh, this is a comment on worship yes. today. <laughs> and they had no problem sitting mm. with total strangers in a concert hall 
and singing their hearts out and standing up and dancing. There was That's freedom. That's quite a vulnerable thing to do. Exactly. There was freedom in the place. I And we were with our, we had our, well, our two daughters were with us. And even then, them, they were loving us, weren't they? I, okay. Now, for a sense of equity <laughs> around the table, I dread, I'm, I'm, I'm almost right. He's Holding my breath. When it comes to music. Nigel, favourite genre of music? Well, I love getting out my playlist of classic rock and getting on the treadmill at the gym with the earphones in and running to, you're just another band out of Boston. <laughs> or, now this, this is a Christian show, isn't it? Meatloaf, Bat like Out of Hell. Out of hell I really go at full all... pelt to really? Bat Out of Hell. Because I'm, I'm a kid of the 70s I, and 80s. I did love Meatloaf, oh yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Some very wow. good balance. I would do anything. <laughs> oh yeah! I used to have a soft top sports car uh, at that time, and I used to have that on full blast with oh. the roof down. Yeah. I think nothing like you've it. just lost all your Gen Z and millennial. Yeah, listeners. no idea <laughs> what we're talking about. Come <laughs> back, Google Sam. All is forgiven. Google, no, no, don't, don't, you eat. no, don't. <laughs> yeah, no, that's true. Don't. Oh, misspent youths. Okay. Right, shall we move on? <laughs> Might be an idea. <laughs> yes, indeed. As we spent 10 minutes entertaining our loyal listeners, it's yeah. actually why, why you love us. You love our authenticity and relationship. The class behind the glass, as we have come to know them, are nodding at us. You know that is our broadcasting manager, Ross. Hi, Ross. The class behind the glass. And today we have producer Look, so you know, and uh, our social media manager, Karis. So the class behind the glass. Okay, now, last time we were, we really sat in a, a sober conversation about the epoch of the crisis, the epoch and the era of cyclically weak leadership, despite strong personalities, but the inability for transformation. We talked a fair bit about the need to stay focused on Christ and to be spirit led and top tips for that so that we don't get seduced and distracted and sidelined into populist opinion, the news agenda and the sense of being derailed by what the world is doing uh, in a day where Jesus is shaking the earth, very much the Isaiah concept of the Lord rising to terrify the earth or to shake the earth right now mm -hmm. so that the nations of the world realise that where they have put their hope does not hold. So as you watch this, remember that this is onto something. Jesus Christ knows what he is doing. God is arising to terrify and to shake that Jesus, the desire of all nations, might be seen as the only hope, the only security, the only way. So that's the bigger picture stuff. Now, what we promised you, and we'll do it in this episode, and we'll we'll follow it up in the next episode, because there's a lot to talk about, is how do we think about the church now, who is usually, can I be honest, a little bit pathetically on the back foot? Is that too stridently said? Nope. Mm, Good. I would argue that's unfair, but that may be... There we go. Uh, there, yeah. there. No, that's fine. And that's can, why we're here. We can discuss yeah, very that. Very kind, yes. Merciful. Mercy, yeah. David. And um, But not always proactive. Not all... I mean, everybody's doing their best job. We get that. Nobody wakes up in the morning and think, how can I do a dreadful job? Mostly. <laughs> Uh, do <laughs> they don't know they're doing a dreadful job. That's the issue, That's Emma. the point. I think it depends on what church you're looking at. Yeah. True. That is true. I that is true. Yeah. The voice of wisdom. The Shostakovich voice of wisdom. So there we go. But we're we're wanting to sit in today some concepts around what is God saying about the church? What is God, uh, how is he leading us into this more proactive, maybe more offensive rather than reactive and defensive position? The shifting into being ahead of the curve, not behind the curve. We often find the church in the back foot, on the back foot through uh, our history. We find ourselves in the back foot with the printing press. We find ourselves in the back foot with, with Hitler and the, a lot of just um, not understanding because of course prophets weren't in play mostly then and prophets are those who give you your timings. We're not all things to all people. We're irritating but we do understand timings as our portion in the body of Christ. So we we are here to keep the church on time with what God is requiring in this season. So broad area to go into. Let me um, start us off 
with a thought around uh, leadership and then we could go a hundred directions and we probably will because we are those people. <laughs> um, but uh, you enjoy us for that reason. Let us start off with the frustration around... Shall we start with Sunday services? Look at the face. Oh my. Shall we start there? There's a lot to be said. I know the heads just went, what? But the frustration around the gathered church, mm. the frustration around the church not scratching the itch, mm. the frustration in, in the hearts of leaders that they know it's not working. How many leaders say to you and I, uh, it's not working, it's not working. And what is God saying to leaders and what is God wanting from leaders as they lead and mobilise the army of God to be effective at this time? Is that too broad? Who wants to pick up the bat on? <laughs> You're right. all saying that, mate. Well, right, I, David. I didn't expect you to go there. there. <laughs> I didn't expect you to go there. But as you did, <clears throat> um, I think uh, in the context of a crisis and in context of leading our nations as the Ecclesia of God should be doing, yep. um, I think there is the nub of your problem. If we distill our church down to an hour or two hours on a Sunday you are on a hiding to nothing. You are going to be ineffective. That is not what the, the early church was. It's not what the most effective examples of church was in history. If that is all you're going to do and that's where your focus lies as church, then um, you're, you're doomed to failure. You cannot compete with, for example, a preacher, a teacher cannot compete um, with... I don't know, 45 minutes. How long do people get now in, in most churches? Half an hour to... to 10 minutes sometimes. 10 minutes in some Head places, talk. yeah, to to um, to expand scripture and to uh, delve into the wisdom of that. That cannot touch people who are being schooled by whoever their pundit is on, on their favorite news channel or in any other kind of media. The kids nowadays are scrolling for hours on TikTok or YouTube mm -hmm. each day. So how can your half an hour have anything more than a drop in the ocean? Um, and and that's just for starters. Even taking communion, um, if that's an important part of your, your Sunday, your Eucharist service, um, how can that compare to the conversations people are having around tables mm -hmm. in workplaces, in society, in culture? It, it has to be something. Church has to be something more substantial than just uh, an hour the or Sunday two. Centric. On a You're Sunday-centric. You're really centric. pushing against what has become a failure, and the failure is the Sunday-centric approach, which doesn't actually curate and lead no, uh, not even the people in the room, let alone the culture of yeah, the nation. Yeah, and don't misunderstand me. I'm not. I'm not saying throw it out. Um, no, no, we it have, has a we, value. We have tried it. Look, anything that you can think of with church, we have tried it over the True. years. We are very experimental with things, and we've certainly tried doing that that event uh, on other days of the week, other times of the day, and just not having it at all. And I think it holds a place. But if that is your focus, if that is church to you, and that is how you're trying to lead society and culture, it is a in, in a time of crisis and even in a time of, of plenty, that is not going to be um, very effective. Mm -hmm. That is a very helpful start. And I think because of uh, the sense now uh, with social media that the best sermons in the world aren't scarce you can find them that if you have a, a faithful, well-intentioned, good, solid minister who's churning out their best work, doing a decent Bible series, but you actually can go online and get a better communicator and a more gifted orator, you know, you can understand why you're a bit bored within the Sunday context. So even when you do turn up to the Sunday context, it's not actually the fullness of of shaping your thinking because you're assessing it against a gifted preacher somewhere else in the world because because that's not scarce anymore. And whereas before your Sunday uh, teach was perhaps the only thing you had of biblical input, it's just not. Mm. Although I do... Um I call it the Blue Peter problem. Did you guys have Blue Peter oh, in, in yeah. Ireland? Yes. So, Children's TV program. So for those of you who don't know... this I, beforehand. It was... A, yes, <laughs> here's something I made earlier. It was a, it was like a, a, a magazine program on TV for, mm. for children in, in, in the UK. Um, and the, uh, when I 
when our own children were growing up, they they never got into um, Blue Peter because they didn't really watch terrestrial TV mm -hmm. as we had it. So mm -hmm. they would get their children's programming from just online. They would watch kids' mm -hmm. programs on mm -hmm. YouTube. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I always um, bewailed the lack of... Um, that Blue Peter idea where there was an editor, there was a curator who was taking little portions of the program and putting it together in a way that made a proper meal for mm -hmm. us as children. Whereas if the, if, if the people are just left to pick and choose whatever the algorithm feeds them, it's not always a healthy way to, um, a nutritious way to grow. So there is the sense that a church, you hope a church community will provide some editing to what you're consuming. And so whilst there's great stuff out there, if that is all you're doing... You're getting everybody's headline act rather than yeah. a process journey, I, I, yes. I think so. And yeah. you're self-selecting yourself yes. rather than a combined wisdom um, giving you a balanced diet. I mean, it's interesting you're talking about Blue Peter. Everybody should go and Google Blue Peter if they haven't <laughs> haven't heard of it. But it really was an epic and an iconic. Mm -hmm. um, it's not. It's, does it still go? Yeah, I, th I think it, it does. Yeah, it does. Yeah. But My uh, niece and nephew just got their first Blue Peter badge. badges. Yeah. Okay. But here's here's the thing. It was very interactive with yeah. the audience. Yes. There were things to be worked towards. There was a very very diet. But if you even look at the the way it was presented, and this has a bearing on the leadership a bit. Um, it was uh, I it was usually two guys and a girl, mm -hmm. so you had both sexes, both genders, mm -hmm. um, who were represented. Mm -hmm. It was very, very interactive, and um, there was such an incredible diet. It was educational and enjoyable, mm -hmm. and relational all at the same time. Yeah. And I suppose when it comes to, if we're, if we're talking about just the moment about Sundays and, and mm -hmm. the issue of being bored with church, at the end of the day, I, I just find it extraordinary that um, we still are arriving at buildings and sitting in rows and looking yes. at the back of people's heads mm -hmm. when what, what we're crying out for and what the church is all about is is people and relationships and what comes out of the combination mm -hmm. of our relationships together. And yet we're still yeah. so uh, washed with the past and the f I don't know what it is, what, with the fear of, mm -hmm. of, uh, of moving on to try different things and what we're afraid of and what we think we're going to lose when there is everything to gain from reimagining. Oh, I know you don't like that word, Emma, reimagining, but looking again, creative mm -hmm. expression, um, not for the sake of it. Yes. Yeah. It mustn't be. Yeah, because sometimes be when you talk about that, you think, oh, these, these yeah, creative just, expressions of church, things. No, it's just this, a social club. This is mm. about really understanding what the Spirit of God wants yeah. to do through His yes. community. Your, your fear issue that you raise, the kind of, uh, how much, I would use the phrase, uh, weaponized nostalgia. Yeah, yeah. That, you know, our love of tradition in error, it's weaponized nostalgia. Mm. I don't want to be a rabid deconstructionist and just aggressively say I want to dismantle everything yeah. you know because then then you do get people who feel very shaken because where are my anchor points mm. but I mm. think you're, you're what you're pushing there Louise is the lack of play with the spirit of God mm. in waters that are good with him where he says let's go on an adventure of what I need you to be right now mm -hmm. Nigel yeah I mean wow I think it's worth saying that all four of us around this table love the local church, yes. love church. Yeah. Yes. We've probably all grown up in it and yeah. we've all planted them and lived them and everything. So yes. it's not an attack on... And shut on, them and, and open them. them. And, and, but all of us have shut them and, and opened them. And still spend more hours in a week than anything else talking about Absolutely. how we can yeah. better it. Yes. Totally. Yes. But there is no doubt that we are in a season right now and it's a season within a much bigger era of experimentation and trial, particularly, I think, related to the local church, yeah. because we are heading towards things that the previous seasons of local church are unable to handle mm -hmm. for fivefold ministry. Yeah. 
bringing the believers into maturity so that they can become the ecclesia. Mm -hmm. Those are the headlines of the things that mm -hmm. the church faces. And so it is entirely in order to be experimenting. I think the Lord's actually given us permission prophetically yes. in the prophetic yes. words that have come out that this is a season that we can experiment and try because there is coming a time, and I suspect it's about 18 months to two years away, mm -hmm. where we will, have, we will be established in new things. Things. And we will, you know, if we're still struggling with the old things, we're going to be in trouble. But we, if we've experimented and tried. So, so for instance, I mean, these are some radical ideas, but I'm part of the generation that watched church go to the state, the place where it had the stage, the band and everything at yeah. full pelt. And I love that. I mean, I love the big worship. Yeah. But as a church leader, I know the strain of trying to put that on every week. Mm -hmm. And there is a sense in which yes. that is, is part of celebration, if one likes, so that maybe once a month you have a big celebration you put all your time into, and then you ask, well, what are the other things? And, and that's what's up for experimentation, um, so that we can actually venture into, I mean, we're talking about the Ecclesia all the time. How do we get to the stage mm -hmm. where as a church, and not yeah. just a couple of individual intercessors or yes prophets or whatever. How as the church are we governing, ruling and reigning in the heavenlies over the territories God has given us? And I would want uh, for our loyal listeners to remind us our objective here that we are identifying crisis, catastrophe, Armageddon type, apocalyptic type feels in the atmosphere, generations who are rattled by that. So we're not playing a game no. just to move things around because it no. takes our fancy because we just, mm. you know, mm. we're, we're like that. You know, like mm. I move the settee around in my house because I think it looks better in that corner. It is not that. It is the radical underpinning ideology that we must have a church that leads and rises mm. and a remnant that knows what it's doing, that knows how it's function, it functions best, that knows how to gain strength in its togetherness and therefore we create yeah. our, a new understanding of belonging and mm -hmm. rootedness mm -hmm. with each mm -hmm. other. And so I, I want us to discuss um, in our uh, time together the research by Dr. Todd Hall and it's mm -hmm. he's based at the Rosemead School of Psychology and his um, research, he posed these sorts of questions and I, I, I paraphrase, what really changes us and what really transforms us? This sense of we love teaching, we love prophetic words, we love prophecy, we love, we love all of that and we have value for all of that. But what is measurably known to transform us, all, all of those things do to, to degrees. Um, but his answers are, and this is the order he puts them in, you are transformed the most by suffering. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we would all agree. Number one, you're transformed by suffering. Can I say in the widest context, Hitler suffered and was transformed. So just the suffering alone doesn't actually create the outcome you want. Mm -hmm. um, number two, your second transformation comes through a certain sort of prayer. Mm -hmm. And it is the prayer of encounter mm -hmm. where it is a, a more reflective prayer, a relational prayer where it's not your list it's not even necessarily warfare prayer. It's not a strident prayer. It's not a petition prayer. It is a encounter type of connection with God that transforms you. And I think that is hugely missing from any corporate expression. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We only pray either um, adoration prayers or... Uh, structured prayers that we can all get on board with. We rarely have any corporate gathering prayer of reflective encounter. And I don't mean just meditation. I mean encountering the living God. Yeah. And that is measured, well, fairly understandably so. And number three is confession of sin. But not individually in the context of a group Mm -hmm. So he is listing these key elements of mm -hmm. the, the, the faith journey 
Um, I think he's lifting them and putting them into the corporate space that we suffer together, we encounter together, we confess together. In other words, we share the story of our lives is basically what he's saying. I think what he's pushing with the James 5 conversions. And so he's pushing these kind of ways of being together that we are most transformed by. And my comment would be how little of that is found in anything that we would share as the people of God corporately together. And yet they're our most transformative. Hmm. Not that there's a dismissal of teaching, not at all, but it's the prioritization of how we spend our corporate time together Mm -hmm. that I think we're pushing here. Mm -hmm. Who wants to pick that up? In how we make the church become the church. I I think I'd love to hear you expand more on what the, and and even for us to chew over what is meant by each of these three areas. Um, The thing that immediately strikes me is hearing it is that it sounds like three different um, church movements or or, or theologies. The, the, The suffering is something that the, um, our, some of our traditional churches um, uh, focus on very well. They, mm-hmm. they, they mm-hmm. Our, our parish church system here in the UK, for example, whether that's Anglican in, in, in England or Church of Scotland up here that deals with births, deaths, marriages and, and, and has long had um, a, a good understanding of suffering and being a having a part to play in people's the suffering of people's lives chaplaincies and yes, hospitals yes pentecostalism charismaticism and word of faith don't do suffering well no but what 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 they do well or better is encounter arguably mm-hmm. arguably could do better yeah. certain sorts of certain encounter. sorts okay and then the third the confession of sin is something that um, Anglicanism Anglican does well. Catholicism and I'm going to I'm going to absolutely push back on that. Excellent. because I, Excellent. Don't you love this? Because it's the confession of sin in relationship, mm-hmm. in a group, ah. yeah. not the confession of sin so through liturgy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I don't okay. know that anybody has landed that. Ah, I think okay. it's prayers of encounter with great sense of being in the realms and the spirit with God and experiencing him live together. Mm. Nobody does that well. And I actually think that we don't know what it is to strengthen each other in our suffering. And I think when you're looking at the traditional, I I certainly had somebody who came to me and said to me, I'm leaving your church to go back to the Catholic church. And I'm like, why? Because they let me, they let me suffer better. And and I'm like, what do you mean? Mm. Well, she, I, she said to me, I just want to sit in my pain. Ah, So, so so all of it, all of it is a, is a, is for me, I know this is very strong, just badly done everywhere. So how do you, so you, so how do we avoid encounter that is just lying on the floor, half asleep? How do you avoid suffering that is just wallowing in your, pity. your pain and confession of sin that a, lacks a, a, a authenticity? A curt glance at suffering yes. as part of the, you know, the Lord's Prayer. But that's the where, well, that's where the whole being in the spirit, because what you can end up doing is saying, oh, so we need to suffer and we need to get a different sort of prayer life and we need to confess our sins to one another. And then we're sorted. no. That's not that's not what this is about. No, this is not a golden it's, goose that lays no, a golden egg absolutely formula. Absolutely not. Yeah. It's about uh, by the spirit, in the spirit, contextualizing. It also for yeah. me is with a plurality together. We navigate these these waters. Yes. I mean, I love the three that you're you're bringing out because it it brings particularly, can I say, to the charismatic church, which yeah. many of our listeners may be from that mm-hmm. background. I, I'm not sure, but this brings a wholeness because it's not the avoidance of our humanity or our mm-hmm. journey. It's it's actually it has a very healthy feel about it. But uh, the other thing about it is it's all about. We, it's all about together, which let's face it, the instructions in the New Testament Mm. are the one another's, they're they're corporate instructions. And in our individualistic society, where we're still turning up to church as an individual, very often with that mindset, this is knocking this on the head because um, confess your sins to one another so you may be healed. now, can I just say, this is mm-hmm. dynamite and difficult and yes. challenging because the level of vulnerability that is required here is is tough and you, you need to be able to trust. There has mm-hmm. to be high levels of trust. Mm-hmm. So how do we manage that? And 
my answer to that and my my sense on it is the deeper you go into encounter together yeah. with the Lord, it starts to change the level of trust and relationship we have one with one another. Because um, in the realms with Jesus and with mm -hmm. knowing him with us, you actually, as we fall in love with him, we fall in love with one another in a different way. So when there comes to the suffering piece, we actually suffer together. Yes. There is the encounters together. And then the confession of sin to one another and together, actually, to be honest, is not a big deal. It's almost like just remove. Oh, we need to remove mm -hmm. that. It's removed. And we own it with one another rather than the worry of, oh, my goodness, I mm -hmm. said that in a group and I will. Can I trust the group? And will that go anywhere else? And th those kind of things. Yeah. But we actually get the understanding of what is common to man and dealing with those things corporately in a realm together that is transformative. So what you're bringing up here um, is, I think, is, is dynamite. I think it's challenging, but I think it's doable. And I think the fruit of it is transformation. And it's the sense, again, listeners, so that we get the, the long game here. The conversation is really, you got to figure this out in the context that you are in, because we are saying to you as apostles and prophets, what you have got right now is unlikely to sustain you in measurable, meaningful ways in the days that are coming. Mm. And there is a, I'm clicking my fingers, there is an urgency of experiment in some of these things and reframing, reimagining, if you like those words, deconstructing, whatever it is. It's a push of the Lord mm. for the days that are coming that you might be not just one who survives, but that you might become a people where you are, who are a signpost of thriving in difficult mm -hmm. days. Mm -hmm. Nigel. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are three huge subjects to unpick church history wise and every other way. But I mean, suffering has got to go alongside glory in some ways. I mean, I, I don't know if we can find it there, David, but isn't the verse there that says um, about his suffering and his glory yes. that walk together mm -hmm. in, in, in whatever precisely that says. So as we talk mm -hmm. about suffering, and this is this is a huge challenge, particularly for the charismatic church. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any of us who have been church leaders and walked through our people with suffering, and I've buried several of them that I really hoped we would see uh, healed. Yeah, I'm with and you on that. And, and and the challenges of all of that. But nevertheless, suffering is there and we cannot go into denial about it. Mm -hmm. So there's something that leads to glory with suffering. Um, I mean, encounter is just massive. I, You know, if somebody says encounter to me, I immediately go back to an event in my life where I first had that mm -hmm. encounter. And then there's been many since. But there's that sort of first encounter that I had where I, I came up off the ground changed at that point. Sorry, can I, you give us a definition of what or an explanation of that? Because I think we mean encounter. Sometimes some of us think encounter. I read the Bible or I prayed today yeah. or I listened to a worship song. For utter clarity, Louise and Nigel, I mean, you've got the mic right now. What do we define encounter? Well, um, well, I don't want to put boundaries on it, yeah. but I, I, we have been talking quite a bit recently about wrestling with God and because we're both reading Jacob at the moment mm -hmm. and, and Jacob wrestles with God. Mm -hmm. What was happening there? There's, there's various things, but is God putting Israel into Jacob? Or is God getting Israel out of Jacob? Okay. I'm not sure we actually know, okay, but yeah. out of it all came Israel and he renames and Jacob and it was transformative. Mm -hmm. But the second thing is that he comes up with this limp. Mm -hmm. um, that's, a, that's a big issue. Out of our encounters, what are we coming out with? And there's a third thing we've been talking about. It's escaped me right now, but you, you are hot on it, um, Louise, oh. um, about the not, that God Why didn't God? overcome him. Why God? 
God could not overcome Jacob and looking into that and why God did he choose not to overcome mm. Jacob because he mm. wanted what he wanted to emerge from Jacob or what the dynamics were around that. But I think when we're talking about encounter, there's so many yes, different levels and that word is going to mean different things to different people. But I think we would say the pair of us that, that our understanding of encounter is it's it, it can be through the word. It can be in prayer. Mm. Yeah. It can be in a, 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 a settled decision moment where you enter in or it can be a suddenly surprise moment. Mm. But encounter is personal and encounter is relational. And encounter is something that you start off by it being, as Nigel said, like, mm. There's the big encounters, the life changing scenarios where God meets with you, knocks you over, speaks in an audible voice or whatever. Yeah. But actually what we're going for and what we're wanting to move into is a perpetual ongoing encounter of him dwelling with us and us dwelling with him. Yeah. That's the direction we're going. Um, and mm -hmm. even back to what we do uh, as church, for me, I think meeting with God, which is the old way that we would have said, is all about encounter. And that's what he wants. But instead of us sitting in rows and it, doing it in, in, in ways we have done before, he is hot on our heels and hungry in the atmosphere mm. to meet with his people and for us to encounter him um, and for him to encounter us. So it's a, there's a mutuality in it. It's 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 coming both directions. I, I'm just pulling up a, yeah. qu a quote on my phone, yeah. which I, I heard the other day, which is a, a, a fascinating quote because you brought up the Jacob thing. Mm. And interestingly, wrestling with God, Sam and I spoke about this um, in a previous podcast in a more recent episode where we were talking about the fact that in, in our youth, we wrestle Satan. Mm. How do I win over my sin? How do I win over my temptation? How do I win over the onslaught of what he wants to, you know, hem me in with? But as we age, we learn that it is better to wrestle with God. Yes. And that so I don't want to sit in my wrestling with Satan. And this is the quote I heard. So um sorry, I've don't have my glasses on. <laughs> Do you see? Are we interview? borrowing <laughs> each other's glasses? Um yes. Um it is the author Nikos Kazan. Oh, is the author of Zorba the Greek? Okay, let's just go with that with the unpronounceable okay. surname. Okay, I'll do. So he's in a conversation. Fascinating. He's in a conversation with a monk named Father Makarios. Has anybody heard this quote? Yeah, and the monk um, had once said that he wrestled the devil, figuratively speaking, of course. At a later time, the author of Zorba the Greek said to the monk, do you still wrestle with the devil, Father Makarios? Not any longer, my child, came the reply. I wrestle with God. Mm. With God, the author exclaimed, and you hope to win? No, <coughs> I hope to lose, my child. And this sense of, I want to encounter God and I want to lose the wrestle mm. because I want to be so overwhelmed overcome. by him yes. and overcome by him yeah. that I want to grab him, wrestle and lose mm. to his great consuming <laughs> power mm. and majesty mm. and I don't want to be one who spends my life wrestling my sin and my temptation and the things the enemy puts it's in very my way. boring I had a fascinating conversation yeah, yeah. with the author of Zorba the Greek there you go there Greek. we go Zorba the Greek. it Can just you? came into my head that I'd heard that we would be informed day. by Zorba uh, the yeah, Greek where, yes yes the, the wrestling and um that's a brilliant quote, it though, is, isn't it? Because that is maturity. Yes, you know, yes. it's like I'm. I've done dealt with the flesh, and I've dealt with the enemy. I've been through those phases, but my greatest joy is to wrestle with God. 
Isn't that that marvellous? The, enc- the encounter that drives yes. it. But to do that collectively. Oh, marvellous. And, and I know that as charismatics, we're like, I cut this thing off, I rescue you, I cast, cast yeah. that demon out, we'll do that. We will do yeah. that. Yeah, we'll continue for to. exorcism in the body of Christ and we're all more demons than we would like in us. But the sense of the corporateness of can we wrestle and encounter with God together, David? Yeah, I think that's the uh, that's what comes through... Um, we, we bring the prophet spin on things. We're a prophetic ministry. We're around mm-hmm. the prophets, apostles, yes, but prophets. And so if you asked any different member of the fivefold leadership, these mm-hmm. same three areas, they might come out with a different spin. Mm-hmm. But but we're all about a certain type of encounter as prophets and the glory coming. Mm-hmm. Um, I, the, the, the confession of sin, I think, does involve deliverance ministry. We're, we're always about it as prophets. We, we, we can never get... Mm-hmm healed up and delivered enough we're we're always pursuing that the fear of the lord is weighs heavily on on prophets in that so um and that's james chapter Mm 5 for clarity james chapter 5 verse 16 about confessing your sins to each other why so that that you you may may be healed healed is how the verse which is you know that's why we do our mass deliverance days Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, we're confessing our sins together. We are then casting out the devils off us. We're getting as free yes. as we can be. Oh, there's another stumbling bot I've identified in my family line or in my own mm-hmm. life. Let's deal with it. Let's let's come up with a way, not just that we can do it in ones or twos, but actually let's do it as a whole congregation of God's mm-hmm. people. By the way, just before we forget about it, the Nigel, the sufferings, First uh, Peter 4, 13, but rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. Yeah. yeah, suffering and glory. Could David, could I ask you this question? Because it fascinates me. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful. Is powerful Availeth much. Availeth much. Yeah. Good old King James you know, the boy. The boomer in the group. The boomer in the group. Yeah, it's powerful and effective. I am fascinated that we quote that, oh, your prayers are powerful and effective, you know, ad nauseum, but not the bit before. And the fact, David, I'm going to come to you with this, that could you say that your prayers are, this is wild, but I think we're... Powerless and ineffective. Your prayers could be powerless and ineffective (laughs) if you are not in the confession of the sin bit, because they are linked together in Scripture. They are not a separated concept. You don't get just to pick and choose the second half of the verse B because you like it. You have to put A and B together. The confession of sins and that your healing and your power and your effectiveness is all inextricably linked in with, Scripture. With confession. Oh, oh, David. He's pulled it oh, up on his mm-hmm. computer. Mm-hmm. Pontification. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yes, and, and then it goes on to say Elijah was a man, he prayed earnest, just like us, yes. he prayed earnest that it would not rain and, and it did not in, rain. In, in other words, the, co- the, 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 the sense there is he commanded the weather in the context Text. of confession of sin and shame. Oh, yes. Right. Burden bearing. Okay, so now I'm, now I'm happier with where the conversation is going because I think I just... <laughs> oh, good, I, good. I think... <laughs> When we Very when important. we began this this suffering and confession, and yeah. it just felt a little bit too wallowy for me. Oh. But actually, when you move into now now we get the prophetic meat in it. That actually, yeah. it's, it's also something. you can confess confess your sins to each other, not so that we can go woe is me and oh I'm oh, such no. a sinner and and, yes. and and back to there. But actually, you're rejecting so that you can, your Presbyterian roots for a different outcome. Well yeah, done. Yeah, <laughs> and and pray for each other and and yes. pray for each other yeah. so that you may mm. be healed with powerful and effective prayers that are as strong as Elijah's ones yes. that stopped up the heavens come for on. years over an entire nation. That is the level that we're dealing with when we come to confess our sins to one another. That is the interaction, the dynamics that should be going on, the type of prayers yeah. and healing that are as powerful as, as Prophet Elijah's prayers. That's fascinating to me, David, because coming from a different tradition where mm. there wasn't confession of sin in that in that mm-hmm. sense mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. powerful praying was really encouraged and understood i am mm-hmm. actually liking i mean emma you'll know i've talked about this quite a bit and used that scripture that i really felt it was something god was pushing in on the body of christ and saying confess Sorry. here 
sins to one another so you may be healed. I actually didn't pop it on to the next few verses. But Nigel and I, I don't really even remember this, but we went through a phase where I really encouraged this even between ourselves to see the effect of confession of sin just even within a marriage. Now, I mean, I'm not talking about ma- major stuff, but I'm talking about the honest. You, you don't. Maybe they, you just confess them to me. Well, you? That, you know what? And then do you know what? There was as He's far not, as this, the east is from she, the west. She liked the wallow. I he, didn't no, like I didn't like the wallow. What I liked was the exposure. Yes. I felt like there was a power in the exposure and the vulnerability of saying, "I was proud there." Yeah. Or I was this in Being that exposed. situation. No, but in exposing, you be, you're exposing sorry, yourself. Expo- yeah. Reveal. Let me Re- use the word revealing rather than exposing. It <laughs> sounds sounds better. <laughs> but um, in, mm-hmm. I'm supr- I'm not surprised you don't Apocalypse remember because I knew revealing. it meant more to me than it did to him. But the effect <laughs> of actually speaking Ouch. it out and saying it in a safe environment, yeah. it was yeah. it was incredibly mm-hmm. freeing, and I would say there was a deliverance attached to it um, and I don't even know whether people do that with one one another where they can say you know I short, had a bad short account, short short account. account. I got too irritated I had there. a bad yeah. day I, yeah. and because if we can catch it and help one another we then own that correctly together so that we can even pray for one another I, I, I have to say it makes me giggle uh, in 90, well, and we'll, we'll come to you this. Uh, <laughs> uh, it makes it's got arms I'm getting more, more I don't know where I'm going with this <laughs> it, it makes me giggle uh, my boys are, are part of a, a, a Christian um, kind of like camp type thing that they go away once a weekend a month. I adore it. It's so good for them. And they they spend time together just locked in rooms, praying and worshipping around the clock once a month. It's a very good discipline. But they are constantly confessing their sins to one another. And they don't even bat an eyelid at it the way we as wow. Gen Xers and Boomers would. I mean, they're like, but why I giggle about it is it's always the same sins. Why? <laughs> because they're teenage boys. Yes. So, you know, I, I, so <laughs> and then I say to him, was it lost again? It was lost again, wasn't it, teenage boys? And they look at me with wide eyes like, how did you know? <laughs> you know, and I just go. I'm a prophet, <laughs> but to be fair, you know, it's blatantly obvious. And so, but I keep the I'm a prophet line in because it keeps them on their toes with me. But anyway, um, so, <laughs> uh, but I'm watching the, I'm watching that bless them in a remarkable way. Yeah. But they want to be pure because they've told somebody else they weren't, you know, and it happens to be another 15, 16, 17 year old. So anyway, but they're, they're figuring it out and they're making all sorts of ridiculously over um, stretched promises about their levels of purity and I'm like right fine great go for it um, I will only kiss the person that I marry I will never you know all of this yeah, and, yeah. yeah but I quite like the intent and I will only um, make eye contact with the girl that I'm going to marry and I'm like right now that's ridiculous so but bless the minutes <laughs> but I do think that perhaps as we age the sins are more complex yes they're more um, hard motivations they're yeah, carried yeah. pain that I didn't surrender they're 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 more layered they're more nuanced they're fine it, Tuning. They're for, they're not. It's the journey, not of. Now there are moments of. I don't know. I lied. I whatever. You know the the the, the kind of the headline acts. But I think it is the more that I confess to you that I am still struggling to process, and so I would want the confession is in uh, a, a age appropriate. In that sense of, I'm not sure I have learned how to walk out my healing. Am I still agended in this? Is this leaking out of me because there is a wounding here? And so that and, and that takes a group of people who know you, who know what you were like before, during and after, which puts the aging confession of sin really solidly in the place of ongoing relational dynamic, mm-hmm. Nigel. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's interesting what you've you've said about the the generations because as mm. as you were talking, I was just thinking there was a, a situation a couple of years ago 
very public where a well, very well-known uh, Christian leader in a conference started to confess his sin in front of everyone. And a friend of mine was there and it was a multi-generational conference mm-hmm. and he confessed a sin related around uh, pornography. And mm-hmm. the person said to me, it was fascinating to watch the, the different generations, the older boomers were tut, tut, tut. <gasps> How do you say that in public? They didn't say it was wrong. They just said it was out in public. <laughs> the Gen Xers were going, at last, somebody's honest enough to, yeah. to do this. The millennials were kind of, what's the problem? Yeah. <laughs> and the and the Gen Zers, the younger ones, mm. were who are far more focused on purity, were like, "Oh my goodness, you're not doing that, are you?" Still and, at your age, yeah. Yes. And and yeah. this this is so yeah. how we also interact oh. with confession. And I suppose I say yeah. that because we're, I mean, we started off talking about leadership, and we've ended up here. But mm. particularly as a leader, mm. I mean, you've got to say yes to it, but you've got to be careful where you where you do that oh, confession, yes. Um, yes, because so you can stand up in front of your congregation and confess confess That's something right. and it's over. You know, it's the, the whole congregation can go go for yeah. the hills. Because it can't bear the weight. No. It has yeah. to be group appropriate. And, yes. and so it's important, and we may mm-hmm. touch on this again as another mm-hmm. one, to have those um, couple of people mm-hmm. whom you can talk to about things, particularly yeah. as a leader. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and they may not even be in your church. They may be mm-hmm. peers or colleagues or whatever. But you have that environment in which you can start to to unburden that. Yeah. And we have to, if we're going back to the scripture, we've got to remember, it doesn't say this is how you confess your sin. It just says confess yeah. your sin. Uh, within a group context. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. very yeah. important. It's not It's not prescriptive. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I did go to an, uh, a weekend called an encounter in the Netherlands. I was there as, as, as very much the old man and, and older leader with a couple of my friends. And just like you said with your mm-hmm. son, mm-hmm. you know, if I, I, by the end of the weekend, I said to my colleague, if I have to sit around another campfire because they were outside <laughs> and hear another bunch of blokes talk about exactly oh, what we goodness. know what, I am getting out of here yeah. and I'm getting on that plane. <laughs> Well, that's why it needs to be dealt with. I, uh, we have as prophets, we have to do it. I, I think uh, a little, um, a little thought. I don't know whether it, it it means anything, but as you were wrestling with the word to use, um, Louise, whether to use exposure, yeah. and then actually, I think that's where it's when it's an exposure. It's, there's a shame kind of thing, mm-hmm. and it's 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 too late when it's an exposure. A re- and you chose the word revealing, yeah. and um, it made me think of the one the one Dutch word. Suzanne will be proud of me on this, although I'll not say it right. But the one Dutch word that I I have remembered, and and uh, she's the class behind the glass. Uh, she's looking she's looking she's looking oh in. boy, pressure! But they have uh, it's very similar in Danish too. So I was hearing it at the weekend. Their word for revelation is apple. Open barren or open barren. Oh, she thumbs up. Oh, yes, okay, yes. good. Um, which always, I always makes me smile because it's, um, it, it sounds to me in English like open bearing. Yes. You're, you're open bearing yourself, and I think if we as a church can be open bearing with her, then there's no need for exposure. Yeah. But we're just open bearing ourselves yeah. to, to, yeah. to one another and praying for yeah. one another yeah, yeah. with the prayers of Elijah. Yeah. Effective and fervent. Exactly. There we go. And powerful. And well, it will avail much. I, I love yes. our weaving conversations. Yes. And I hope, loyal <laughs> listeners, that this has radically blessed you and given you the class behind the glass is nodding. We're yes. getting the, the, the approval from the producers and the broadcasters. and the Skip assi- the jazz bit. But <laughs> the what? The jazz bit. No, oh, did you want to delete the jazz bit that I hate jazz? I thought you were going to ask me my favourite trumpet player. I was going to say my husband's my favourite trumpet player. He's, He's always blown, blown his own trumpet. He blows his own trumpet brilliantly. <laughs> <laughs> it's so cheeky. Right. Loyal listeners, There's we started off by talking about crisis and very genuinely, I don't want you to lose the connection here between our thriving and sustained place at the cutting edge of nations in crisis. And you can think, well, how on earth does I share my suffering and somebody prays for me to be strengthened or we share an encounter in the spirit, we lead each other in that way or we confess and we pray. How, uh, don't miss the link that when I do that in the space of the gathered church and I reframe, reimagine, restructure to create those as priorities, along with the things that the uh, the Bible says are important, like teaching and and our corporate singing over one another. But if we reframe and we give our space, self space and time to reframe and rethink that, you actually create a readied church. You actually create 
a strong remnant, a readied bride. And so we are in the waters that maybe look disconnected, but are highly connected to the efficaciousness of the people of God and the remnant in these days. And when you and I become the persecuted church, you and I will need to have thought about these things. So I bless you to share this, to like this, to subscribe to this, to if you want to watch us on video mm. rather than just uh, the audible that you get on the podcast, you've got to go to the Par TV app because on our Par TV app, you get to see our interactions because we video this as much as we uh, record this audibly. So make sure that you are over on the Par TV app and that you are sharing and subscribing because this is a conversation your small group, your church leaders, your nest of believers around about you will need to have listened to this. Next time, teaser, we are actually going to look at what God is saying to leaders. But I think we're going to have a wee break and have some Chinese food for lunch first. Okay, <laughs> see you in the next episode of What the Prophet.